So we're going to move from polynomials into rational expressions and simplifying and multiplying them. So what is a rational number? That's the first thing that we need to talk about. We discussed it a little bit in the beginning of class, but just for review, rational numbers are quotients or fractions, fancy word for fractions, of integers. And again, what are integers? Whole numbers, positive, negative, and zero. So some examples of rational numbers would be like two-thirds or three-fourths, okay, fractions. Fancy word for fractions. But now rational expressions are quotients of polynomials. So it does tie in to our last chapter. Still dealing with polynomials, but now we're looking at a quotient or a fraction of two polynomials. So what would it look like? Got a polynomial up top and a polynomial down below. Boring polynomial, since it's just a constant, but it still counts. We've got a fraction of polynomial up top, polynomial down below. Something a little more exciting. T squared minus 16t plus 1 all over t. More exciting polynomial, more exciting polynomial. Again, we're looking at a fraction, so it is a rational expression. So a rational expression indicates division, obviously, since we have fractions. So we have to be careful to avoid dividing by zero. Because if we do, things explode down here. So in our first example, we were only ever dividing by seven, so that's fine. But over here, if I plug in zero for t, this thing is going to explode. It's going to have some issues and not be defined. So that first example, x minus 8 over x minus 2. So if x is actually equal to 2, then what happens? What happens to that expression? If x is equal to, the expression becomes... what? 2 minus 8 over 2 minus 2. So we get a negative number up top, that's fine, but down below I have 0, which isn't defined. Not defined. We can never divide by 0. In later math classes you'll study the implications of what this means. Picture-wise we have asymptotes, but in this class we're not going to worry about it. But we do need to figure out all of the numbers for which the rational expressions are going to be undefined. Because it's different depending on what polynomial I have down here. So in this case, I couldn't plug in 2 because it'll make my denominator 0. But up here, I can't plug in 0 because it'll make the denominator 0. This one, I could plug in whatever I want because the denominator is always 7. So it just depends on which rational expression we're looking at. So we need to find all of the numbers for which a rational expression is undefined. In our next example, we've got that polynomial up top and this one down below. So again, what does it mean for the rational expression to be undefined? The denominator, whatever is down there, cannot be equal to zero. So our little notation Equal with a line through it just means cannot be equal to. Okay, so how do we solve for those x values? We saw this in the last two sections of chapter 5. We need to factor and set each piece equal to 0. So I've got a 1 out on the front. I know I need an x and an x. And I need to break up negative 10 into things that are going to multiply to negative 10, add to negative 3. So we need negative 5 and positive 2. And when I have two things being multiplied and it's equal to 0, or in this case, not equal to 0, what can we do? Either that first piece is equal to 0 or not equal to. And what does that mean for our x value? I cannot plug in 5. That's our first. Or the second piece, x plus 2 cannot be equal to 0, which means x cannot be negative 2. So we can plug in any numbers that we want except for 5 and negative 2. Because when we do that, our denominator is going to be equal to 0, and that can't happen. So go ahead and take those next two. Find all numbers for which the rational expressions are not defined. 
So in the first one, again, the denominator cannot be equal to zero. So if I set the denominator not equal to zero, what does that mean for my x value? It cannot be three. I can plug in anything else, and you can actually try if you're not convinced. If I plug in zero for x, I get out negative three. In the denominator, that's legal. If I plug in two, I get out negative one. You can try a whole bunch of other numbers just to convince yourself. But once I hit three, three minus three is zero. Thing is undefined. And then what about for part B? I only ever had 18 in the denominator, which isn't zero. So what does that mean? I don't have any restrictions. I can plug in any number that I want, and this thing will be defined. So we want to look at combining these with different operations. And the first one that we're going to look at is multiplication. So when we're multiplying rational expressions, things that have variables, it happens in the same way when we're just multiplying rational numbers without any variables involved. So we go straight across the top, 3 times 9, straight across the bottom, 5 times 2. So we get 27 tenths. Okay. And we always want to ask if we can simplify when we're working with these kinds of rational numbers when we multiply them. So the same story holds with our rational expressions. We want to be able to simplify as far as we can go. So again, to multiply rational expressions, we multiply the numerators, numerators, and what else? We multiply the denominators together. In the end, we want to make sure that we simplify as far as we can go. So let's look at a few. First example, whenever I have an expression with a sum or a difference in the middle, I'm always going to group together what comes together in the beginning. Because if I multiply anything times this quantity, x minus 2, I have to give it to both pieces. I'm going to have to distribute. So in the very beginning, if we group together what comes together, we're less likely to make mistakes. And I don't need to throw a grouping around 3 because he's singular. If I multiply something times 3, it's literally just something times 3. We don't have to distribute to more than one term because there's only one involved. So let's look at this multiplication. What has to happen? Again, we go straight across the top. x minus 2 over times x plus 2 over 3 times x plus 7. So do you see why we need those parentheses? because I'm going to have to FOIL this out in order to get rid of those parentheses. I'm not just going to multiply negative 2 and x together. If I didn't write the parentheses on there, that's what it would look like. So in this case, if we look to simplify, is there anything exactly the same top and bottom that we can cancel out? No. It's as far as we can go. And let's look at another numerical exam example. But I'm going to kind of do the reverse now. So, how can I break up 14 into its factors? If I break it down, I have 2 and 7. So we're kind of doing the reverse of what we've just done. I'm starting with a number, breaking it up into the factors. And again, what happens in this case? Can I break it up? Yeah, I've got 2 divided by 2. And if I take 2 out of the numerator, what am I left with? 1. So what is 2 divided by 2? Same thing, divided by the same thing as 1. So we're left with 1 seventh. So that illustrates my point that we want to be able to break it down as far as we can go and simplify. So after we've multiplied, we always want to check. Written in those factors, is there anything common that we can get rid of in the, both the top and the bottom? So let's look at a few. Very beginning, 8x squared and 24x. So if I want to break 8 and 24 down, first of all, do they share anything in common? Just look in between the numbers. They both have a factor of 8. So I don't need to break 8 down into 2 times 2 times 2. I can just break 24 down into 8 and something and cancel it with this 8 up top. So we don't always have to break it into the smallest factors possible. We just need ones that are common that we can cancel out. So, let's take a peek. Up top, I've got 8 
and x times x, two factors since it's squared. And we could break up 24 into 8 times 3 times x. If we multiplied it all together, we would still get to this rational expression. But now we can look and see what's common that we can take out of both of them. So same thing divided by the same thing is 1. It's gone. And our x is same thing divided by the same thing, 1. So what are we left with up top? x, and what are we left with down below? 3. Okay, practice some more. Taking the next rational expression, we need to look at what we can cancel. So down below, I've got 10. So up top, I need a factor of 2 or 5 or 10 to be able to cancel with it down below. So let's look. Common between our numerator's terms, what can we take out of both? factor of 5. And when we do that, what are we left with? a plus 3. So now that everything is being multiplied together, we can start canceling it out. So 5 goes into 10 two times, and we're left with a plus 3 over 2. And how come I don't need the parentheses around a plus 3 anymore? What am I multiplying by out on the front? 1. 1 times anything is just itself. So our most simplified version, we don't need parentheses out there. All right, let's look at the next. Looking between the top and bottom right now, I can't see what's going to cancel. And let's just go ahead and try to factor the numerator and the denominator, because we need everything to be multiplied together to be able to cancel things out. So common between my two numerator terms that I can take out of both is a factor of 6. I'm left with a plus 2. And down below, common between 7a and 14 is a common 7 that we can take out of both. And when we do that, we're left with a plus 2. Sometimes we have to factor in order to see what will cancel. So common in the top and in the bottom that we can get rid of. Same thing divided by the same thing. So it's going to simplify to 6 sevenths, 6 over 7. So trying a few more on the next page. Looking at D, we can't see necessarily what's in common, top and bottom, or what we need to work towards. So let's just start factoring numerator individually and denominator individually. So looking at the top, common between these two terms that we can take out of both is a factor of 2x. And when we do that, what are we left with? 3x plus 2, and that is all over what? So look in common between these two that we can take out of both is a factor, again, 2x. And what are we left with on the inside? x plus 1. So now that we have multiplication everywhere, we can start canceling out those factors. Same thing up top, same thing down below. We're left with 3x plus 2 over x plus 1. And again, we don't need the parentheses anymore around these, because we're just multiplying by 1 on the outside. Okay, E, last one before I set you loose. Got a trinomial up top and a coefficient of 1. And all of my signs are positive, so that tells me these are going to be positive. And 2 is prime, so I know I need 2 and 1. That one just kind of factors itself as we ask the right questions. And we can double check. If I multiply 2 and 1, I get 2. If I add them together, I get 3. So we did factor it correctly. And I've got a binomial down here, two terms. So first question should be, is it a difference of squares? And it is. And it breaks up into x minus 1, x plus 1. Since we have multiplication everywhere now, we can look common up top, common down below. Cancel out those terms. So what's left? x plus 2 up top and x minus 1 down below. Alright, so take those next three, simplify them down as far as you can go. So common between the first two in the numerator that we can take out was an x. When we did that, we were left with 2x plus 1. Everything is factored. We only are dealing with multiplication now. 
And in the denominator, common between these two is a factor of x. When we do that, we're left with 3x plus 2. So again, common up top, common down below. Same thing divided by the same thing is 1. So we've got 2x plus 1 over 3x plus 2. You can always check at the end. Can I go any farther with this? Can I break it down any farther? No. Next one. Up top, we've got a difference of squares. And we've seen that one before down here. So we know how that factors. And I have a trinomial down below with a 2 out in the front. So you might be tempted to try the AC method, but 2 is prime, 1 is prime. So we really don't have that many options. We just have to figure out what sign needs to go where. So my larger combo between outer and inner needs to be negative. So that when I add them together, I get a negative. So what's larger, 2x or 1x? Larger one is 2x, so this one needs to be negative. That one needs to be positive. So again, looking, common up top, common down below, that we can cancel out of both. And we're left with x plus 1 over 2x plus 1. And the last, common between these two terms that we can take out of both, is a factor of 12. When we do that, we're left with y plus 2. And now, what do I want to break 48 up into? Knowing that I have a factor of 12 up top. I'm going to break 48 up into 12 times 4. We don't need to break it down into its prime factorization. We just need ones that are in common with what we've already factored out. So, same thing up top, same thing below. Cancel that out. We're left with y plus 2 over 4. We always want to check at the end, can we go any farther? Is there anything else that we could cancel? Nah.